Welcome to Laurel Canyon Kitchen. I'm Holistic Chef Nikki, and today I'm here with Robert Mack. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yay. Robert is the author of Happiness from the Inside Out, an amazing book, because Robert is a happiness coach, which I cannot wait to hear more about this. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, I think I'm probably the least likely person in the world to be a happiness coach. Really? <laughs> yeah, Why is I, that? I feel like I was born unhappy. I mean, really unhappy. I was stressed out, anxious, insecure, and I always thought I would grow out of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that didn't quite happen. It just got worse. You know, I became yeah. more and more depressed over the years, despite doing pretty well academically, athletically. I never, I never really had a whole lot of friends, but I um, just continued to get worse in terms of depression. And I got to a place where I was deeply and truly suicidal. And I was experiencing suicidal ideation probably dozens and dozens of times a day, every day for years. Oh, I'm sorry to hear yeah. that. I've, yeah. I've been there too. And um, yeah, it was a long journey out of depression, but really? um, you figured it out. Yeah. And I love that because um, I didn't have a lot of friends growing up either. I would always have like one or two people that I really trusted, yeah. but I was bullied really bad growing really? up. Yeah, terribly. So... I hated myself for a long time because I thought something must be wrong with me. No, totally. And, I think yeah. it's, you know, such a strange experience being a child mm -hmm. <laughs> growing up, even being an adult. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think it's pretty incredible. And this is what I love convers about conversations like this. It's like you suddenly realize that whatever experience you've had, somebody else in the world, many, many other people in the world have had the same experience. Yeah. And that was part of my discovery too. Like when I was... I started doing some research because I was like, oh, I got to figure out what's going on with me. Like, why am I so depressed? And I discovered, oh my goodness, like most of the world goes through a depressed period of time at least once, often twice, more than that. Right. And um, so I realized I wasn't sort of alone in that. Did mm -hmm. you discover that too? Or? That's a great feeling. Yeah. yeah, I believe that too. And um, I went down like a pretty dark path where I was like experimenting with drugs and trying to find a way to feel fulfilled inside, whether it was like sex or drugs. But then I remember I would wake up in the morning. This was when I was like 18 years old. And I would wake up in the morning and be with myself again. And I realized I need to learn how to like myself, the person that I'm waking up with, because there's nothing that's going to eliminate that unless I actually work on what's really going on. That is so deeply inspiring to me because I think most of us run away from, right? The yeah. discomfort, obviously. And um, that is such a great point, which is like the only person you can't divorce is yourself. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, it's like if you can learn to make friends with yourself, you begin this like lifelong love affair that never ends, exactly. right? And then it makes it so much easier to get along with other people mm -hmm. and for them to get along with you. You know, it's really hard if you don't like yourself, love yourself. It's very difficult, if not impossible, to really connect with anyone else in a full, authentic yeah. way. So it's pretty incredible. And I feel that we are far more powerful than we believe because – I see a lot of people have like protective mechanisms because they think that they aren't mentally strong enough when we really are. Totally. Like that's such a great point too. And I wish that as children, we were taught like better coping skills and right. Yeah. Cause we're not, we're really not, we're not taught how to emotionally regulate or be cognitively agile or how to pivot or reframe. Right. And you learn yeah. those things over time, usually the hard, you know, the hard, difficult way, yeah. but it's like one of those things I'm so grateful for having learned eventually. Right. But I had to suffer a lot of pain and suffering to get there. It sounds like the same thing. Yeah. With you. And we were both, I mean, we both went through peers where we were like in Hollywood where you're dealing with rejection. I was so afraid of rejection because I hadn't really experienced it much growing up. Even though I was an athlete, I was always striving to be the best, but I didn't. If I didn't, if I wasn't number one, I was okay with it because yeah. I would know that I tried really hard and did the best that I could. But the thought of being rejected by people terrified me to the point where like I wouldn't even go on auditions because wow. I just thought I can't handle it. And then when I started getting rejected, you know, in like the corporate world and in relationships, I was like, oh, this isn't that yeah. bad. Like, <laughs> that, okay. that, that's the realization and epiphany that we all have if, yeah. is if you, you know, sort of practice it enough. Mm -hmm. Yes, you get better, but most importantly, you stop caring so much. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. matter. It doesn't hurt as much. Exactly. I remember doing the same thing when I was like, I was voted most high in my high school class. And I remember getting to a place in my life where I was just disgusted with that. Like, oh my gosh, how can I not talk to people, especially women? And I remember forcing myself to just say hi to like yeah. 10 women a day. It didn't matter. I you know? do that too. Yeah, did you really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I put myself on this like training program really. Yeah. It, just so I could become more comfortable with people. And it was interesting to your point. Like you just realize that 
for the most part, rejection only hurts because you haven't experienced it enough, yeah. <laughs> which is strange. And it's also, um, it's an ego bruise. Yes. Because I was like, oh, I've reached almost 35. I've only been rejected by like two guys. Yeah. I'm okay. But then I realized, wait, what was my immediate reaction? Ego bruise. Yeah. And I sat with that and I thought, this isn't you not feeling worthy. This is you having an ego bruise. And um, I would say like the getting out of the comfort zone as being a shy person is something that you really have to make a conscious effort to do it because now as an adult, I go out with people who are like, oh, my child is shy. Like, okay, well, like, what are you doing about it to help socialize them? My parents used to force me to talk to adults. Wow. So they would have a party and I was bad around kids my age because I was really shy if I didn't know someone. Well, my parents would make me go out in the party, introduce myself to every single person and talk to them. And I was like, <laughs> this is so weird. It's overwhelming. But then when I got older, um, I realized, shoot, I have to network for my business. I have to go to this party and talk to people. Yeah. And it was so scary at first because I'm the one who would rather pet the dog in the corner. Yeah. Oh my gosh, totally. I'm the person who always befriends the children. Yeah. Like, they're easy to connect with. They're just, exactly. You know, yeah. And even though I'm talkative when I'm like comfortable with someone, the thought of like making small talk with a bunch of strangers was terrifying. But when you make that effort where you're like, put yourself out there because I don't know, it's like developing the strengths where I'm sure you've experienced this in your business, like social media. Yeah. Oh. I love it, and it's also exhausting. Impact on people's mental health, I think. Um, It's really easy to compare yourself to others. And I think that that's also where I learned a lot in personal growth because I would look at someone and be like, they're beautiful or they're successful or they're this, but like, why are you comparing yourself? Like, what do you have that they don't have? So that's what I do all the time. That's why I'm never jealous of anybody. People think it's actually weird that like, I don't get jealous. I don't want what anyone else has because I'm like, they don't have my heart Uh or they don't have like my family, you know, like it wasn't an, I better than you never, but it helps me mentally to think like, but they're not me. I love that. And so, like, like, I know oh, who I am I love and I'm screwed so up, but like, yeah. I love, I love who I am. Yeah. So I'm okay. Well, there's nothing about you that feels screwed up to me no. at all. And I will say like, that all resonates with me so much. Like I also realized early in my life, I had this problem with jealousy. Right. And uh-huh. so I've like actively and intentionally and very strategically worked on that because I was like, I have to overcome this. This is ridiculous. And then I, now genuinely, I'm so happy when someone is doing well, if they're healthy, if they're, do- if they're wealthy, whatever it is that they're yeah. doing, if they're successful with. I just love that. It makes me feel inspired through that. Emotions are more contagious and infectious than anything else on the entire planet. You can yeah. pass it through a cell phone, through technology, through a laptop, through a glance, yeah. right? All the way across the world, you can do that. Exactly. So it's pretty wild, actually, when you think about it. And that's both a challenge, particularly if the emotion is quote unquote negative, but really powerful and meaningful and impactful if it's positive emotion, right? right. It's like, you know, happiness spreads and happiness exactly. um, is, is infectious. So I just love that point. And I think that's one of the reasons I love this quote. It's a Robert Holden quote and he says, happiness is your gift to the world, you know? And we find that that's true in science too, that we find that the people that are happiest, essentially they lead more successful lives, yeah. right? And they're not, they're not more successful first. They get happy and then they, you know, essentially have happier relationships. They live six to seven years longer. They make more money, about $600,000 to $700,000 more on average over the course of their entire lifetime. Um, but happiness really truly is your gift to the world, I think. Yeah. I don't know about you with like how you've gone in your journey, but for me, like the way I became confident was by like pretending to be confident. Oh, totally. Very helpful. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. I had, just- I was like, I was like, you just walk down that street with yeah. purpose. Like, yes. you know it when I really want to just like, don't look at me. Yeah. I don't want to look yeah. at me. But like when you just say like, I've got this, like I'm okay, I'm confident because it's a freaking mental game. And that's why I'm curious to hear more about the science of happiness. Yeah, yeah. It's funny that you say that. Uh, one quick note there. Like I worked in the like fashion business for 10 years as a model and I was so insecure and so uncomfortable. But that experience in that industry helped me to do precisely what you just described, which is like sort of like practice your way into being it, but you kind of have to fake it for a long time and really talk yourself up to get there and stay there, right? Yeah, so, um, you know, there's a lot to be said there. Amy Cuddy does great work um, around that whole sort of idea of like sort of taking on um, the mentality and even the physicality of someone who 
you think would be confident. So another version of yourself, mm -hmm. right? Basically acting your way into it. Um, but yeah, the science of positive psychology has a lot to say, say and share around how happiness benefits your life, but also how you can become happier. So the causes of happiness, but also what happiness leads to. Mm -hmm. And it's quite a f fascinating because I think we've all heard the cliches like, you know, just, you know, follow your bliss and the money will come and kind of, kind of thing. But there's a lot of truth to a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. Have you discovered that in your life? I have for sure, because I was always doing what other people thought was best for me for a while. Um, and then I remember I was like running on the Hudson River in New York and I thought, wait, but what makes me happy? Like, where do I thrive? And I thought, oh, when you're involved in like health, fitness and helping people. So I was like, create something like that. Okay. And that was when I like immediately got into nutrition school and decided to completely change my life and do what actually makes me happy, which was a big risk yeah. because I had like, you know, I had a cushy job waiting for me and I was like getting my real estate license. I was like, I'm going to be good doing what other people think is best yeah. for me. Nick, you have done everything. Are you kidding? I've heard like 15 <laughs> industries already. It's incredible. You've lived like um, a really but rich life. I will life. say like to be completely honest, like the, for me, I needed to be stripped of a lot of distractions to actually start taking this journey seriously. Like for me to be, I spent a month volunteering in Tanzania and I was living, you know, the superficial life in New York yeah. and I'd been doing volunteer work my entire life, but I was still so far removed from the emotional connection with it. And it was when I had nothing and I met people who had nothing and they were the happiest people I had ever met in my life. Like these were beautiful people who had no roof to their house. The children had never played a video game, but they were playing with rocks in the street and they just, they hug you and they're so happy. And I was like, I want that. Mm. And seeing that the simplicity of happiness with nothing, that was when I was like, I'm going to figure this out. There's two quotes that I always, I just, I'm a lover of quotes, right? Yeah, There's two quotes that I love. Too. One is I was in happy because I had no shoes until I met the man who had no feet. Yes. Right? And there's another one which is like, um, you're not unhappy because you don't have what you want. You're unhappy because you want what you don't have. Yes. Right. And it's um, hard because you don't, I don't, I would never want to discourage someone from wanting to live a bigger life or a more blissful life or a healthier or wealthier life. And that being said, there's just so much to be said for loving who and what you are today and loving your life for what it is today, even if it's not exactly what you would I picture. I completely want, agree. It's right? the journey. Yes. The journey is what we can't forget because if we're constantly just looking for like the next bigger, better thing, we're going to miss out on what life actually is. Well, totally. That's exactly right. You're so busy creating a happy life that you forget that it's the happy moments when strung together that make for a happy life. Yeah. So you miss this present moment and this present moment and this present moment before you know it, you know, you're 120 years old and you're like, where'd my life go? Yeah. So it's such a great point, which is like, presence, right? The, the value of sort of like remembering that happiness isn't something outside of you in the future. It's something inside of you that exists right here and now. Exactly. But totally. And that's why I feel like ultimately happiness and a commitment to happiness is the most selfish thing and the most selfless thing you can possibly do, that's right? Because like, great yeah, because I feel like the way you do, it's like, I'll be honest, like I love people for me. Yeah. Not for the, like, you know what I mean? Like there's yeah. a part of it for them for sure. Of course. But like I experience the benefits of that love first, even if they don't experience the benefits of me loving them. No, it I feels still so feel good it. to give. Right. A hundred percent. And that took me a while to get to, because when I was younger, it was all about like people pleasing and I was right. That way too. Yeah. And I was trying to be a good person and you know, I still want to be a good person, but you realize that that's sometimes putting it the cart before the horse mm -hmm. and I realized I became very resentful about people because they didn't even say thank you and I did these things and I was like yeah. oh Rob you got a twisted brother like it's all about doing that from a place of perfect selfishness where you experience the emotional and spiritual benefits yourself first and foremost and do it without an expectation of reciprocity you just do it like the same way the rain or the clouds rain down on the earth, just indiscriminately, unconditionally, without an expectation of reward. You yeah. know, you just do it to kind of relieve yourself of the bliss that's inside of you. I had to overcome that too. I know how you feel because I was like, I expect people to like be as kind as right, I am. Right. Like, why don't you love as hard as I do? And I was like, not everyone is built like you. They're maybe giving like the best of their ability. And like, whether that works for you in relationships or not, like is up to you. But as far as strangers, it's like, 
you know, I used to be a people pleaser where I was a doormat. People just used me, took advantage of me all the time because I thought, oh, I just want people to like me because I feel so long from being bullied and all that and having like not a lot of friends. And then it was when I started like building boundaries and I thought, oh, those people only call me when they want something from me. So those aren't real friends. Yeah. Oh, those people are using me. But oh, those people are mirroring my energy. See, oh, so good, Nikki. Like you're that's right. That, that's the other sort of challenge and opportunity is to recognize sort of the filters that we have on our own eyes and perception of the world and how we often just are getting back precisely, what, obviously, what we're putting out. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes we're not even, it's not even that. Sometimes we just think we're getting back what we're putting, right? Like, there, like I, for instance, there was a period in my life when I really didn't like myself and I would say, well, nobody likes me, right? But then I began to shift that and work on that a little bit and I was like, oh, I actually do like myself. There are things about myself that I feel proud about or I appreciate. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, people seem to be very kind to, towards me and very yeah. appreciative of me. And I'm like, oh, well, Rob, that's just because on one hand, it's just a mere reflection of what it is that you feel on the inside. Yeah. And secondly, we all have these perceptual filters that color the way we see life, mm-hmm. right? So, and yeah. I always like to say, you know, what helps me if I like don't get appreciation return is I think, but you put that out there, you put love, kindness, and happiness out there, it's going to come back to you. Totally. Always. It may not be today or tomorrow, but it always, I believe in like the law of cause and effect. And it always, it makes, not only does it make you feel better, but it's like, hey, my life's going to get better because I'm looking at the bright side and like putting the love out there. Because it's easy for us to just become victims, feel sorry for ourselves. Well, yeah. And, th- and the truth is, it doesn't matter how justified you are in your upset, your anger, your sadness, you're still ruining your own present moment yeah. and you're pre-paving pre- pre- a future of more of that, right? Like, mm-hmm. So I just love that. The other thing that you said I just thought was so poignant and remarkable is that you're right. Like happiness shared isn't happiness divided, it's happiness multiplied, yeah. right? Like it's that which is incredible to me. It's like the only math that works that way, love too, right? It's like you yeah. share it and you get more of it, right? There's more exactly. of it in the world. And so, and you can change. Like I found that um, if I go somewhere with someone and they may be in a mood and they enter the situation with a little hostility, they're like, oh, the people who work here are just so difficult. Mm. I will walk in and be like, overly nice and just like no drama all of a sudden those people are nice to me back totally and i have a better customer service experience too and everything like you know the saying kill them with kindness it's not fake it's like hey i would love for you to be nice (laughs) (laughs) i love that so much absolutely agree with you and you're right about that like i was reading an article the other day and it was just basically was talking about how to become more persuasive and mostly particularly in this world, it can feel so divisive. And whether it's politics or religion or something else, we're all trying to convince each other through like logic and reason. But at the end of the day, a much more effective way to persuade and influence anyone is to connect with them as a real human being. Like leave that whatever divisive topic off the table for now and just connect and be kind and have a moment where you share something, a moment of joy and of love. And um, then sometimes you're surprised, but I'll even bring the topic up. You come back around and the person's like, you know what? I kind of see it from your perspective or vice versa. I mean, that's how car salesmen sell you cars that are too expensive. What if that person was having a really bad day and like that moment they had with you, like made their day better? Like, you know, and everybody's going through something. I mean, that one thing we can be sure of is that if you're part of the human race, you've suffered and you've yeah. experienced pain. And um, and that being said, you're right too, which is like we've got these no- mirror neurons in our head that make it almost impossible not to re- like smile in response to somebody else's smile, right? So that means when somebody's not responding with a smile, when you smile, they have to really fight that. That takes a lot of effort. Yeah. You know, it's so much easier to smile. So I just love you saying that so much, Nikki. And I love this idea of you walking through the streets of New York, smiling at people. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah. it's funny. I mean, I'll even go on a hike with my mom in LA and we're the ones who are like, hi, good morning. And everyone's like, what the? What? Yeah. We're like, yeah, we genuinely like want to say hi. Yeah. I mean, my mom's from the Midwest. So oh, maybe yeah. it comes from that. But I want to hear about like your journey of like writing this amazing book yeah. to share your teachings with everyone and how you became a happiness coach. Yeah, so good question. I mean, I was going through that period of depression, suicidal ideation, and at some point I decided to do some research on like how, like how to kill myself. Oh, and yeah, it was a little oh. tough. And um, I decided I was going to slip my wrist. I still have the suicide test marks my oh, wrist there yeah. to this day. So I had, this, I had a moment, but something strange and unpredictable and 
almost ineffable happened in that moment, which was that for no good reason, without my external conditions or circumstances of my life changing, I mean, honestly, I had a pretty good life, great consulting job, beautiful girlfriend, but something shifted inside. And for one moment in time, I felt this perfect peace and subjective well-being, love, and sort of this like fathomless, unfathomable joy. It was just, mm -hmm. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to postpone the suicide for like 15 minutes. That's all it was. I mean, I, I wasn't even committed wow. to the whole 15 minutes. I was just like, 15 minutes, I'll do a little research. So I put it off for 15 minutes. I started doing research. And then I was like, oh my gosh, like this, there's a whole thing going on out there in the world where people are depressed and they're suicidal or they're overwhelmed or they're stressed out or anxious. And so that 15 minutes sort of leaked into like an hour mm -hmm. and then several hours. And then I sort of made a commitment that like, look, if I can have one moment, just one moment where I feel deeply joyful or at peace, I can repeat that somehow. I'll find out how to repeat that. Yeah. And it's just like rinse, wash, repeat. And so if you can experience, so all that being said, did a ton of research, started keeping a happiness journal, which is like, these are the things that are helping me feel happier every day. I love that. Yeah. And it eventually became happiness from the inside out. I love that. That's such a great message. And I was suicidal when I was 18 and I, um, I made two attempts and, um, both of the times I was actually on drugs. So I knew it wasn't what I really wanted, but I felt like the first time I felt like I was saved somehow. Um, cause I literally like drove my car into a construction pile, like hoping that like it would kill me. And something was off with like the angle of my car where like nothing happened to me. I literally just like kind of smashed the front of the car. And then my dad found me and I tried to lie yeah. and pretend like, oh, I was just driving erratically and I was fine. And then I was like, oh, this is really unhealthy. And then the second time I overdosed on pills in my dorm room and my um, ex-boyfriend who's no longer with us because he ended up ODing and passing away years later, he pried it out of my mouth and he saved me. But he was an addict, alcoholic, so we had this very toxic relationship because he was older than me and I was a little like 18 year old who was trying to find something in s to heal the emptiness inside. And what helped me like get out of it was getting real tough love because I had been in therapy for years with depression and anxiety and I have ADHD. I have like a lot of things and I had bullshitted so many therapists pretending to be okay. I would be honest always, but I would hide a lot. So there was always a piece that I was hiding and I had a lot of childhood trauma that I was hiding as well. So I told my parents, I was like, I'm not addicted to drugs, but I want to like go somewhere where I can get like hardcore therapy. So kind of like a rehab, but like for my brain. So this therapist told me, she was like, you better get your shit together. You're not going to bullshit me. I was like, oh. okay. <laughs> so she she sent me to this place with, you know, my parents' blessing. But I was a legal adult, so, like, I didn't have to go. Like, it was my choice to go to this place. And when I arrived, they're like, okay, write your life story in a minimum of 14 pages and share it with the group and uh, stop justifying your behavior. I was like, whoa. whoa. Nobody had been, like, that tough with me before. It was always, like oh, poor thing, you're crying, or you're a brat, we're going to punish you, or like, well, just go to therapy. Because, you know, my parents didn't know because I was hiding so much from them. Like, they didn't know what to do with me. And it was in this place where I had, like, no distractions that I finally got, like, down and dirty with my problems. And I came out of there like a completely new person. Holy smokes. That's the most profound story. Well, thank, you. thank you so you. much for sharing that. Yeah, I, I actually shared, like, my life story with a bunch of strangers, which yeah. was really scary. But after that, I was like, this is where it starts. Like, yeah. this is where I could finally like get into the real healing process. And, um, so can I yeah. ask you a question about that? Sure. So what would you say? Obviously that tough love and that moment yeah. you had there, what would you say have been the most helpful tips, tricks, or tools for you becoming increasingly happy? I would say gratitude is like the number one thing, like being thankful. I actually list in my head. I started out where I had to physically write it down, yeah, you know, like yeah, your happiest yeah. journal. So like I had to physically write down like the reasons I should be alive yeah. and like I have a lot to live for. And I remembered like I 
let go of a lot of shame in the healing process. But also what reminded me was I was like, everyone has somebody who loves them. And when you feel alone, it can be hard to realize that because you think no one understands what I'm going through. No one knows how, you know, how sad I am. But then I was like, wait, in spite of how much they were annoying the shit out of me, like <laughs> my parents love me and like they wanted to help me. They just like didn't know how. And I realized, how could I leave them? I would ruin their lives. Yes. And I realized suicide is so selfish. Like, why would I do that to them? Because, oh, to benefit myself, just to leave this earth when I would be leaving behind all these amazing people who believed in me. And you could be alone and have no family, but still like you made a difference in someone's life. Yeah. And I think about it that way. We're like, so I, I use gratitude starting and ending every day. And then, um, as soon as I look at myself and I start wanting to pick apart my appearance or something, um, I will focus on qualities that I like about myself. So I'll say, okay, like, this might not be what you want right now, but you have this or like, but this is okay. And I think like focusing more on inner beauty helps you feel better on the outside. Absolutely agree. And there's something else you said there that was just worth highlighting again, because it was a discovery for me too, which was that it's um, impossible really to feel self-love if you focus on that, which you think is most unlovable about yourself, right? So I would always yeah. do this thing where I like, I hate this and this and this about myself. I should learn to love those things about myself. And it was impossible, right? Like, yeah. And so instead I was like, let me just focus on the things that I genuinely and easily like or appreciate about myself. And I did that long enough that when you look back at the things that you think are unlovable, suddenly even they look lovable. You're like, oh my gosh, no, actually that's not that bad. I'm not that, my voice doesn't suck that much or whatever it is. Yeah. But I also love the point you're making around like this inner beauty thing. And there's something really powerful about that because so... In the science of positive psychology, they found they have found that happy people are rated as more attractive because wow. that inner beauty yeah. is really, you know, sort of exuding, you know, from energetically and emotionally that's coming through, and people actually feel it and perceive it as beauty, right? Yeah. So it's I just love what you're saying there because inner beauty, obviously infinite, eternal, um, yeah. but also it has an effect on the way we look physically as well. I think it makes or breaks a person because I've met a lot of very physically attractive people in my <laughs> life. And then I got to know them and was like, uh, there's like not much else there. But um, I think that everyone feels ugly sometimes, like no matter what you look like For or sure. like what you do. Yeah. And um I think like finding what makes you unique and owning it because I used to want to fit in so bad. I wanted to be cool, yeah. but then I was like, <laughs> I'm going to give up trying to be cool and yeah. just like be myself because now you can embrace like being different and being weird and just being who you are because the right people will gravitate. Yeah. If you're exuding positive energy, the right people will be attracted to it. The wrong ones will fall back. And sometimes you find that out the hard way. But still, when you like, when you start strengthening who you are inside, you're like, you know what? I don't need you to like me. Well, see, that's exactly. There's like what eight billion people on the planet. It's like you can't stand on your head enough different ways to make all those people happy. And yeah. if you did, you still wouldn't be happy until you made yourself happy, exactly. <laughs> right? So it's like you might as well go ahead and find a way to please yourself and make the other eight billion people a little less relevant, but then you find from that much healthier, happier, more harmonious place, you're of greater benefit to those people and you're yeah. easy to get along with and they're easy to get along with for you. So absolutely agree with you about that. It's um, interesting how often we take the long scenic path to things and we try to route yeah. our happiness or self-love. I mean, you've made people. it your career in like teaching happiness and I love that you take the scientific approach because like I used to be confused by it because I would be like, Someone would say, oh, I'm unhappy, but I felt like so much happiness. And I was like, I'm going to send you a quote and just like, you know, think this way or like I can help you. And I realized you can't just like tell someone to be happy. Totally. It's like and that way, which is hard. It's like the only thing freely given and never taken is unsolicited advice. Yeah. <laughs> I'm real careful exactly. about that. It's like every piece of advice I give, I try to remember it's always mostly meant for me. Right. Yeah. Um, so you make a great point, which is like, you know, most folks, well, experience is the only explanation ultimately, right? Like you have to kind of mm -hmm. go through it. You've got to get to a place where you've suffered enough and you're done with the suffering. You're like, you know what? Let me try some of these other things yeah. that I may have been hearing about. But you're right. I think um, I've been wanting to 
more and more show people instead of tell them. Yeah, right? Just be that example. living, shining example. I believe exactly. in that too. Because it also helps you protect your energy when you um, – there's the saying, misery loves company. Yeah. So I can understand that when a friend comes to me and they're like feeling really down, I used to, as an empath, be like, I'm going to take on that pain and I'm going to heal them. But then I'm going to feel like absolute crap in the yes. process because I have changed my energy to being in a lower vibration. But now what I do is I'm like, I'm going to protect my energy. So what I'm going to do is be there, someone to talk to, someone to listen but I'm not going to stop my life. Oh, Nick, it's profound that you say that because I remember discovering that I was an empath too as a kid. I was always like, why am I so stressed and anxious all the time? And then I realized, yeah, well, definitely part of that is me. Also though, part of it is just the people I was spending time with, right? You're surrounded by. And you, you're right, you take that energy on and you think that being a good friend or partner or whatever means taking it on, but it actually doesn't. It's no. like in order to be of help to someone else, you kind of have to be beyond help yourself, right? It's like you're better off learning how to swim really, really well before you try to save someone who's drowning, right? Exactly. Like, and so that's part of the challenge is this idea that you want to secure your own oxygen, oxygen max first before you try to secure those. Of, that's exactly that, all. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly what it is. Yeah. It's like it's, it's hard it's like sometimes. put your own mask on first before helping others where we want to just give up what we have built to like just help someone. Cause I was like, I want you to feel as good as I feel. So what I try to do is like, it's weird because also on social media, a lot of people like pretend their life is great. Oh yeah. They pretend to be happy where I'm like, swear to God, mine's all real. Like, <laughs> I'm smiling because I like, I'm really smiling. And if I'm not posting, it's like, cause I'm busy or because I'm having a bad day. Cause I'm a human being, yes. but there's a lot of people like faking a life to have a certain look, but it's like, but are you doing the work inside because you want your life to look so perfect? Like, what about being human? No, you totally, totally nailed it. It's um, interesting. I think it was like early in my spiritual journey, I discovered Abraham X. And, yes. you know, I just love one of the things they said. They said, you know, we get it. A lot of you want to create a perfect life or whatever, but you can't trick the universe and you can't trick yourself. You're trying to trick yourself, but it doesn't really work. So you're absolutely right about this. Um, you want it to be authentic happiness yeah. and that does require work. Um, I like to think of it as play because I enjoy it, Yeah. but it does require an investment of time, energy and effort. But you discover that that investment not only pays off so much better than anything else you can do, it's also Seriously. so much more enjoyable in the process if you're like really committed to it. You know what I mean? It really um, does. Yeah. So I kind of love this idea of like blissipline instead of like discipline, right? Blissipline, like being committed yeah. and dedicated to being as blissed out as I can be um, and doing the work around that because, um, you know, like you said, it's a short life, but it's also a long life, it especially is. if you're miserable. Yeah. And I've kind of like my personal journey to happiness. I've also tied into like the way that I treat my body because I realized when I changed my diet and lifestyle, it made me a happier person from the inside out because my body started functioning better. And I realized I was like, oh, all the crap that I was eating before was really impacting my, I was getting foggy headed. I felt sluggish. You know, I was like deficient in vitamin D, which can make anyone feel kind of depressed. Oh, sure. And it was when I started changing my diet, which is like why I tried to, I believe that health is such an emotional experience as well, because when I became a nutritionist, health nutrition counselor, um, clients would come to me and be like, I want to, you know, lose like X amount of weight because I want to look a certain way. But it was when they started getting more comfortable with me, I realized it was an entirely emotional thing. Wow. It was all connected where they were like feeling bad about themselves. And, um, you know, think about like, like I used to eat my feelings Yes. Yeah. and I hit it really well, but like, it's cause I felt empty inside. So when I stopped doing drugs, I was like, Oh, I'm just going to, eat my feelings yeah. because I felt so empty inside because I wasn't filling up my own cup. And I, that's what made me really inspired to like become a chef and use it in a way where I'm like, I want to help heal people with food. Wow. Cause I feel like that's part of the happy journey because you could do the work mentally, but if you're not like showing love for your body through like, I'm not saying you have to work out seven days a week and eat like a, a champ. No. 
But it's about like making those adjustments because those are acts of self-love. I love the way you like contextualize that. Like I had never, and I wanted to ask you that question, like what led you to, you know, become a cook and chef. And, and, and I, and I, and I love the way you put it because you're right. Like food is love language. I mean, yeah. it really is. And it's like our first really experience is. of like love really before we even understand words or any of that stuff. It's food, yeah. you know, it's your mother's milk or whatever. And so I just love that so much. And you're also right, which is like, um, there's no question about it. The food that I've eaten in my life has definitely affected my mood mm -hmm. um, and my emotions and my energy. Um, and that, of course, bleeds into relationships and the way that you handle your finances or whatever. It bleeds into everything else, it right? Does. Because it's just life is very um, sort of mood congruent. So it's like when you're in a bad mood, everything seems bad yeah. and everything seems to go bad. Yeah. Um, but then you start feeling better, everything seems to go better. So I just love that and I appreciate you sharing that with me. Thank you. Yeah. So today when we go in the kitchen, um, I wanted to make one of my childhood favorite dishes with you, which makes me happy. Yes. So I thought we would make a happy meal. I now. love it. Our I love it. Of a happy, a happy meal. meal. I love it. It's a healthy one. I love it. Awesome. I'm Great. So well, let's get to it. Thank awesome. you so much for joining me Thanks today. for having me. Appreciate awesome. it. Awesome. Thank you. Today is all about happiness. And one of my favorite happy dishes is yakisoba, which is a Japanese street food dish which is typically made with uh, meat and ramen noodles that's stir fried together. But my version is a healthier version. Uh. We're gonna be doing it with spaghetti squash, which I've already cooked. And then we're going to be stir frying it with, um, we're gonna make yakisoba sauce, but I'm glad you agree. We're gonna make this one spicy. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and instead of using, um, you know, full sugar. We're going to be using some coconut sugar, which is a little low, lower glycemic. And then we're going to get rock in the walk. All right. Walk rock in the in walk. That rock. That's awesome. Great. Right. So I'm going to turn the walk on just to get it nice and hot. Right. And then um, let's start adding our ingredients here. Okay. So why don't you dump some of the coconut sugar okay. first? Yeah. Right. yeah. And um, Surprisingly good at dumping. <laughs> Look at that. It's not all and I then do. what we have here, we have some hoisin sauce. Mm. And then we have some tamari, which is like a gluten-free soy sauce, which is like easier digestible. Mm. Then we have a plant-based oyster sauce, actually. Oyster sauce. Which oh, tastes wow. exactly the same. It's using a lot of like nice rich Asian dishes. And then here we have some liquid aminos, which is excellent. It looks simple, but, yeah. and then I'm um, gonna add a little bit more of this. Do you remember the first time you ever had this dish? Yes, um, I was actually, I must have had it first when I was like really little, but um, my best friend growing up was Japanese mm. and my mom would make me the American lunch every day. And then I would have her Japanese lunch. We would switch. So her mom would make me this and I would come home from school. And my mom would be like, you don't seem very hungry. And I'd be like, well, because I had the yakisoba. Yeah. So we're just going to stir this up nicely here. And then the magic ingredient, ketchup. Ketchup. A little oh. ketchup. It adds I that nice salty sweetness. Oh. Yeah, just a little bit. And yeah. then we have our yes. Asian chili, chili sauce. sauce. Gotta make it spicy, I love that. Great. So you grew up in Tokyo. I did, Tokyo. yeah. So I grew up with all these flavors and that's why it's like really close to my mm. heart. But I love doing like kind of my own version of it too by also showing respect for Japan. Love. So what we have here is our wok is ready. I prepped it with some avocado oil. So what we're gonna do first is, it's all about the order of how we're cooking everything. I'm noticing. Yeah, yeah, so the wok cooks everything so fast that we're gonna start with, so here we have the garlic. Then we're gonna throw in onion. Right. See how we're kind of like. Smells amazing already. <laughs> right? Yeah. And then the mushrooms okay. we have here. I don't know about you, but. Are those? Are they like these are some Japanese mushrooms. Okay. They're nice and small. Yeah. It'll be perfect. You can add a little bit of water, but this has enough moisture. And this is a dry heat cooking method. We're going to add some of our carrots here. 
You want to put the longest cooking items in first, uh -huh. oh, and then at the end, I would put like the cabbage at okay. the end, so it all gets in there. And then we're gonna add our spaghetti squash. Oh wow! Now normally this would be made with like ramen noodles. Okay. Spaghetti squash is high in B vitamins. Uh -huh. It's really filling. Love this. Um, you can eat it. Italian style, Asian oh. style, whatever. The great thing about it is you just, you buy the squash, mm -hmm. you put it in the oven for half an hour, mm -hmm. scoop this out and you can make anything with it. Oh wow, I love that. Great. Little by little, we want to kind of start adding our sauce okay. in. Mm. But I think you may have tasted these flavors before. Uh. We'll see. We're going to add some of this cabbage. I love all that color. Mm -hmm. you know? Put that in. People who don't like vegetables, this is a great way to like hide them. I was just gonna say cabbage and carrots. I can't remember the last time I ate those like by themselves. But right? this, because I definitely. It can be boring. Yeah. But you can make it fun. Yeah. So now I'm just gonna keep cooking this. Yeah. Up a little bit. <laughs> I'm gonna mix in a little bit of our ramen. Well, you, this is made out of rice noodles, so it's uh, a healthier version of regular ramen. So we're gonna mix. Do you this. prefer cooking to baking? Yes. Yeah. Right. Cooking is so much fun because it's like a freestyle thing. Yeah. Where you can kind of just know, like I'm eyeballing this, where I'm like, oh, there's a little too much moisture in this. Yep. Yep. I want to mix in some of these rice noodles uh, with the spaghetti squash. Right. With, and with now baking, it's, it's much all more, more even. Uh, baking is science. Yeah. And I mean, all cooking uh, is science, but baking, it won't work if you're not uh, specific yeah. and you don't follow everything, which I admire people who specialize in that. Yeah. Um, I would rather someone else bake my bread. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I'll focus yeah, on this. Yeah, totally. <laughs> if you have a stove top with a fan, use it because your alarm will go off. Oh, <laughs> it's good to know. Yeah. I was a little concerned that that was going to happen to us today, but I'm glad it didn't. <laughs> And we're gonna get some. Oh wow, it looks so A little too. crunch Hello. with some green onion in here, and then um, I have all these edible flowers in my garden that have been blooming. Oh so. wow, what kind of flowers are they? Um, this is a mix of a bunch of different species, oh, but wow. the good thing is that um, I like to use like like garlic flour or chamomile. All right, so now yes. is the moment of truth. Yeah. Where it's hot because it's fresh off <laughs> okay. the walk. Okay. So here so we we've wait. mixed some of the spaghetti squash with some rice ramen for good texture. Oh, wow. It's so good. Oh, it's really like good. It. Oh, man, awesome. that's really great. And just, I feel like it's just the right amount of crunch and spice, actually. Oh, right? great. It's like, yeah, all I'm nice. glad. It could always be spicy. Always, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> always down with that. Great. Well, thank yeah. you so much for cooking thank with me today. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. Now we can dig in.